Hello everyone, we're now on chapter 3 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Thank you to everybody who sent in their story arcs. We'll be looking at those tomorrow, so you've still got time to get them in. I form my resolution, so he's made his mind up. Three seconds before the arrival of J.B. Hobson's letter, I no more thought of pursuing the unicorn than of attempting the passage of the North Sea. Three seconds after reading the letter of the Honourable Secretary of Maine, I felt that my true vocation, so that's the job that he really wanted to do, the sole end of my life was to chase this disturbing monster and purge it from the world. But I had just returned from a fatiguing journey, tiring, weary and longing for repose. I lie down. I aspired to nothing more than again seeing my country, my friends, my little lodging by the Jardin des Plans, sorry Mr Disney, my dear and precious collections, but nothing could keep me back. I forgot all, fatigue, friends and collections, and accepted without hesitation the offer of the American government. Besides, thought I, all roads lead back to Europe, and the unicorn may be amiable enough to hurry me towards the coast of France. This worthy animal may allow itself to be caught in the seas of Europe, for my particular benefit, and I will not bring back less than half a yard of his ivory halberd to the Museum of Natural History. But in the meanwhile, I must seek this narwhal in the North Pacific Ocean, which, to return to France, was taking the road to the Antipodes. Consul, I called in an impatient voice. Consul was my servant, a true devoted Flemish boy, who had accompanied me in all my travels. I liked him, and he returned the liking well. He was phlegmatic by nature, which means he doesn't show a lot of emotion, regular from principle, zealous from habit, evincing little disturbance at the different surprises. Now, um, zealous means you do things really well, um, you're really into a cause or something. Evincing means uh, you didn't show a lot of emotion. So he was phlegmatic by nature, regular from principle, zealous from habit, evincing little disturbance at the different surprises of life, very quick with his hands and apt at any service required of him. And despite his name, never giving advice, even when asked for it. Council had followed me for the last 10 years wherever science led. Never once did he complain of the length or fatigue of a journey, never make an objection, objection to pack his portmanteau for whatever country it might be, is that said right? It's um, like a suitcase anyway. Or however far away, whether China or Congo. Besides all this, he had good health, which defied all sickness and solid muscles, but no nerves. Good morals are understood. This boy was 30 years old and his age to that of his master as 15 to 20. May I be excused for saying that I was 40 years old? But Consul had one fault. He was ceremonious to a degree. Um, means his, his manners were quite pompous and he would never speak to me but in the third person which was sometimes provoking to irritating consul i said beginning with feverish hands to make preparations for my departure certainly i was sure of this devoted boy as a rule i never asked him if it was convenient for him or not to follow me in my travels but this time the expedition in question might be prolonged and the enterprise might be hazardous in pursuit of an animal capable of sinking a frigate as easily as a nutshell. Here there was matter for reflection, even to the most impassive man in the world. What would Consul say? Consul, I called a third time. Consul appeared. Did you call me, sir? He said, entering. Yes, my boy. Make preparations for me and yourself, too. We leave in two hours. As you please, sir replied Consul quietly. Not an instant to lose. Lock in my trunk all travelling utensils, coats, shirts and stockings, without counting as many as you can, and make haste. And your collection, sir, observed Consul. We will think of them by and by. What? The, here we go, Architherium, the Hierocothrium, the Odrins, the Cheropotamus and the other skins... They're all dried animal pelts. They will keep them at the hotel. And your live Barbarossa, sir, they will feed it during our absence. Besides, I will give orders to forward our menagerie to France. 
menagerie is like um, a group of animals. We are not returning to Paris then, said Consul. Oh, certainly, I answered evasively. By making a curve. To being evasive, it means you're avoiding the question. Will the curve please you, sir? Oh, it will be nothing. Not quite so direct a road, that is all. We take our passage in the Abraham Lincoln. Oh. As you think proper, sir, coolly replied Consul. You see, my friend, it has to do with the monster. That's better. The famous novel. We are going to purge it from the seas. The author of a work in quarto in two volumes on the mysteries of the great submarine grounds cannot forbear embarking with Commander Farragut. A glorious mission, but a dangerous one. We cannot tell where we may go. These animals can be very capricious. Um, they go where they like without warning. It can also mean some of these moods change. But we will go whether or no. We have got a captain who is pretty wide awake. I opened a credit account for Barbarossa, and consul following, I jumped into a cab. Our luggage was transported to the deck of the frigate immediately. I hastened on board and asked for Commander Farragut. One of the sailors conducted me to the poop, where I found myself in the presence of a good-looking officer who held out his hand to me. Monsieur Pierre Aranax, said he. Himself, replied I. Commander Farragut, you are welcome, Professor. Your cabin is ready for you. I bowed and desired to be conducted to the cabin destined for me. The Abraham Lincoln had been well chosen and equipped for her new destination. She was a frigate of great speed, fitted with high-pressure engines, which admitted a pressure of seven atmospheres. Under this, the Abraham Lincoln attained the mean speed of nearly 18 knots and a third an hour. A considerable speed, but nevertheless insufficient to grapple with this gigantic cetacean. The interior arrangements of the frigate corresponded to its nautical qualities. I was well satisfied with my cabin, which was in the after part, opening upon the gun room. We shall be well off here, said I to Consul. As well as your honours leave as the hermit crab in the shell of the whelk, said Consul. I left Consul to stow our trunks conveniently away and remounted the poop in order to survey the preparations for departure. Now, I better say here, remounted the poop doesn't mean that he trod in anything horrible. It's a deck of a ship, the poop deck. At that moment, Commander Farragut was ordering the last moorings to be cast loose, which held the Abraham Lincoln to the pier of Brooklyn. So in a quarter of an hour, perhaps less, the frigate would have sailed without me. I would have missed this extraordinary, supernatural and incredible expedition, the recital of which may well meet with some scepticism. Scepticism means people don't believe you. But Commander Farragut would not lose a day nor an hour in scouring the seas in which the animal had been sighted. He sent for the engineer. Is the steam full on? asked he. Yes, sir, replied the engineer. Go ahead, cried Commander Farragut. The quay of Brooklyn and all that part of New York bordering on the East River was crowded with spectators. Three cheers burst successively from 500,000 throats. Thousands of handkerchiefs were waved above the heads of the compact mass, saluting the Abraham Lincoln until she reached the waters of the Hudson at the point of that elongated peninsula which forms the town of New York. Then the frigate, following the coast of New Jersey along the right bank of the beautiful river, covered with villas, passed between the forts, which saluted her with the heaviest guns. The Abraham Lincoln answered by hoisting the American colours three times, whose 39 stars shone resplendent from the mizzen peak, then modifying its speed to take the narrow channel marked by buoys placed in the inner bay, formed by Sandy Hook Point. It crossed the long sandy beach, where some thousands of spectators gave it one final cheer. The escort of boats and tenders still followed the frigate and did not leave her until they came abreast of the light ship, whose two lights marked the entrance of New York Channel. Six bells struck. The pilot got into his boat and rejoined the little schooner which was waiting under our lee. The fires were made up, 
The screw beat the waves more rapidly. The frigate skirted the low yellow coast of Long Island. And at eight bells, after having lost sight in the northwest of the lights of Fire Island, she ran at full steam onto the dark waters of the Atlantic. Chapter four, Ned Land. We're going to do two chapters today. Captain Farragut was a good seaman, worthy of the frigate he commanded. His vessel and he were one. He was the soul of it. On the question of a cetacean, there was no doubt in his mind, and he would not allow the existence of the animal to be disputed on board. He believed in it, as certain good women believe in the Leviathan, that's a monster, by faith and not by reason. The monster did exist, and he had sworn to rid the seas of it. He was a kind of knight of Rhodes, a second Dion Dieu de Cozon, these are all heroes, going to meet the serpent which desolated the island. Either Captain Farragut would kill the narwhal, or the narwhal would kill the captain. There was no third course. The officers on board shared the opinion of their chief. They were ever chatting, discussing, and calculating the various chances of a meeting watching narrowly the vast surface of the ocean. More than one took up his quarters voluntarily in the cross trees, who would have cursed such a birth in any other circumstances. So one of the uh, sailors quite happily took up a room at uh, the top of the mast, as far away from the monster as possible. As long as the sun described its daily course, the rigging was crowded with sailors, whose feet were burnt to such an extent by the heat of the deck as to render it unbearable. Still, the Abraham Lincoln had not yet breasted the suspected waters of the Pacific. As to the ship's company, they desired nothing better than to meet the unicorn, to harpoon it, hoist it on board and dispatch it. They watched the sea with eager attention. So they wanted to see the narwhal or the monster or whatever it was, harpoon it, so fire a big spear into it, hoist it on board and then kill it. Not very nice, though, is it? Besides, Captain Farragut had spoken of a certain sum of $2,000 set apart for whoever should first sight the monster. Were he cabin boy, common seaman or officer? I leave you to judge how eyes were used on board the Abraham Lincoln. For my most part, I was not behind the others and left to no one my share of daily observations. The frigate might have been called the Argus for a hundred reasons. Only one among us, consul, seemed to protest by his indifference against the question which so interested us all, and seemed to be out of keeping with the general enthusiasm on board, so consul wasn't bothered about the monster. I have said that Captain Farragut had carefully provided his ship with every apparatus for catching the gigantic cetacean. No whaler had ever been better armed. We possessed every known engine, from the harpoon thrown by hand to the barbed arrows of the blunderbuss, and the explosive balls of the duck gun. On the forecastle lay the perfection of a breech-loading gun, very thick at the breech and very narrow in the bore, the model of which had been in the exhibition of 1867. This precious weapon of American origin could throw with ease a conical, a conical projectile of nine pounds to a mean distance of ten miles. Thus, the Abraham Lincoln wanted for no means of destruction. And what was better still, she had on board Ned Land, the prince of harpooners. Ned Land was a Canadian with an uncommon quickness of hand and who knew no equal in his dangerous occupation. Skill, coolness, audacity and cunning he possessed in a superior degree. And it must be a cunning whale or a slightly cute cachalot to escape the stroke of his pontoon, his harpoon. Ned Land was about 40 years of age, no age. He was a tall man, more than six feet high, strongly built, grave and taciturn, which means he doesn't talk a lot, occasionally violent and very passionate when contradicted. His person attracted attention. But above all, the boldness of his look, which gave a singular expression to his face. Who calls himself Canadian call himself French? Yes, because a lot of Canadians speak French too. And little communicative as Ned Land was, I must admit that he took a certain liking for me. My nationality drew him to me, no doubt. 
It was an opportunity for him to talk and for me to hear that old language of Rabelais, which is still in use in some Canadian provinces. The Harpooner's family was originally from Quebec and was already a tribe of hardy fishermen when this little town belonged to France. Little by little, Ned Land acquired a taste for chatting, and I loved to hear the recital of his adventures in the polar seas. He related his fishing and his combats with natural poetry of expression. His recital took the form of an epic poem, and it seemed to be listening to a Canadian Homer singing the Iliad of the regions of the north. So a Greek called Homer wrote a very famous poem called the Iliad, which you might have studied in your name. I'm portraying this hardy companion as I really knew him. We're old friends now, united in that unchangeable friendship which is born and cemented amidst extreme dangers. Ah, oh, brave Ned, I ask no more than to live a hundred years longer that I might have more time to dwell the longer on your memory. Oh. Now, what was Ned Land's opinion upon the question of the marine monster? I must admit that he did not believe in the unicorn and was the only one in, on board who did not share that universal conviction. He even avoided the subject, which I one day thought it my duty to press upon him. One magnificent evening, the 30th of July, that is to say three weeks after our departure, the frigate was abreast of Cape Blanc, so it's up, uh, level with, 30 miles to leeward of the coast of Patagonia. We had crossed the Tropic of Capricorn and the Straits of Magellan opened less than 700 miles to the south. Before eight days were over, the Abraham Lincoln would be ploughing the waters of the Pacific. Seated on the poop, <laughs> Ned Land and I were chatting of one thing and another as we looked at this mysterious sea, whose great depths had up to this time been inaccessible to the eye of man. I naturally led up to the conversation to the giant unicorn and examined the various chances of success or failure of the expedition. But seeing that Ned Land let me speak without saying too much himself, I pressed him more closely. Well, Ned, said I, is it possible that you are not convinced of the existence of this cetacean that we are following? Have you any particular reason for being so incredulous? The harpooner looked at me fixedly for some moments before answering struck his broad forehead with his hand, a habit of his, as if to collect himself, and said, Perhaps I have, Mr. Aranax. But Ned, you, a whaler by profession, familiarised with all the great marine mammalia, you, whose imagination might easily accept the hypothesis of enormous cetaceans, you, oh, let me straighten that up, you ought to be the last to doubt under such circumstances. This is just what deceives you, Professor," replied Ned. "That the vulgar should explain in a, should that the vulgar should believe in extraordinary comments traversing space and in the existence of antediluvian monsters in the heart of the globe may well be, but neither astronomer nor, nor geologist believes in such chimeras. As a whaler, I have followed many a cetacean, harpooned a great number, and killed several." But however strong or well-armed they may have been, neither their tails nor their weapons would have been able even to scratch the iron plates of a steamer. Right, so what he's saying here is the vulgar is like, ordinary people can believe in comets crossing space, and they might also believe in monsters under the earth. He says, but neither an astronomer who studies the stars or a geologist who studies the earth believes in strange monsters like Bigfoot, things like that. But Ned, they tell of ships which the teeth of a narwhal has pierced through and through. Wooden ships, that is possible, replied the Canadian. But I have never seen it done. And until further proof, I deny that whales, cetaceans or sea unicorns could ever produce the effect you describe. Well, Ned... I repeat it with a conviction resting on the logic of facts. I believe in the existence of a mammal powerfully organised, belonging to the branch of vertebra like the whales, the cachalots or the dolphins, and furnished with a horn of defence of great penetrating power. Hmm, said the harpooner, shaking his head with the air of a man who would not be convinced. 
Notice one thing, my worthy Canadian, I resumed. If such an animal is in existence, if it inhabits the depths of the ocean, if it frequents the strata lying miles below the surface of the water, it must necessarily possess an organisation the strength of which would defy all comparison. And why this powerful organisation? demanded Ned. Because it requires incalculable strength to keep oneself in this strata and resist the pressure. Well, listen to me. Let us admit that the pressure of the atmosphere is represented by the weight of a column of water, 32 feet high. In reality, the column of water would be shorter, as we're speaking of seawater, the density of which is greater than that of fresh water. Very well. When you dive, Ned, as many times, 32 feet of water as there are above you, so many times does your body bear a pressure equal to that of the atmosphere. That is to say, 15 pounds for each square inch of his surface. It follows then that at 320 feet, this pressure equals that of 10 atmospheres, of 100 atmospheres at 3,200 feet, and of 1,000 atmospheres at 32,000 feet, that is about six miles, which is the equivalent to saying that if you could attain this depth in the ocean, each square three-eighths of an inch of the surface of your body would bear a pressure of 5,600 pounds. Oh, my brave net. Do you know how many square inches you carry on the surface of your body? I have no idea, Mr. Aranax. About six and a half thousand. And as in reality, the atmospheric pressure is about 15 pounds to the square inch. Your six and a half thousand square inches bear at this moment a pressure of 97,500 pounds. Without my perceiving it, without you perceiving it. And if you are not crushed by such a pressure, it is because the air penetrates the interior of your body with equal pressure. Hence, perfect equilibrium, balance, between the interior and exterior pressure, which thus neutralise each other and which allows you to bear it without inconvenience. But in the water, it's another thing. Yes, I understand, replied Ned, becoming more attentive, because the water surrounds me but does not penetrate. Precisely, Ned. So that at 32 feet beneath the surface of the sea, you would undergo a pressure of 97,500 pounds. At 320 feet, 10 times that pressure. At 3,200 feet, 100 times that pressure. Lastly, at 32,000 feet, 1,000 times that pressure would be... <gasps> 97... No, hang on, no, but lots of pounds. That is to say that you would be flattened as if you'd been drawn from the plates of a hydraulic machine. The devil, explained Ned. Very well, my worthy harpooner. If some vertebrate several hundred yards long and large in proportion can maintain itself in such depths of those whose surface is represented by millions of square inches that is, by tens of millions of pounds, we must estimate the pressure they undergo. Consider then what must be the resistance of their bony structure and the strength of their organisation to withstand such pressure. Why, exclaimed Ned Land, they must be made of iron plates eight inches thick, like an armoured frigate. As you say, Ned, and what destruction such a mass would cause if hurled with the speed of an express train against the hull of a vessel. Yeah, certainly. Perhaps, replied the Canadian, shaken by these figures, but not yet willing to give in. Well, have I convinced you? You've convinced me of one thing, sir, which is that if such animals do exist at the bottom of the sea, they must necessarily be as strong as you say. But if they do not exist, obstinate harpooner. How do you explain the accident to the Scotia?